Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Today I'm speaking with Sasha Ayat. Sasha is the founder of Inspired Teen Therapy and the co-host of the Wider Lens podcast. And she deals a lot with gender dysphoria. And hi, Sasha, thank you for coming on. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Abed. Um, and so I, like I just mentioned, you deal with a lot with gender dysphoria, but I mean, I'm assuming it's more than just dysphoria. So if you wouldn't mind talking a bit about uh, Inspired Teen Therapy and then what led you to that. Sure. So um, I'm a licensed professional counselor. Um, This type of work requires you to get a master's degree and then get licensed. So I'm a therapist. I've been working with adolescents for um, over 13 years. And in my practice, I see young people, uh, mostly teenagers and young adults who are struggling with issues of gender identity. Um, If you want me to give a little background about how I got into this work, I can do that. Um, I've I've always been interested in um, psychology and group psychology and how our environments influence the way we think about things. And I also studied a lot of like sociology, trying to understand uh, more about group behavior when I was in undergrad and grad school. And so I had kind of a background in some like feminist studies and um, all that sociology. I studied a bit of history and I, in in my graduate program, there wasn't much talk about things like gender identity and sexual orientation. Um, We learned about uh, transsexualism as it was kind of referred to at the time or gender identity disorder. And I didn't really give it much thought. Um, I thought, gosh, you know, it'd be such a destabilizing experience if somebody grew up really believing that they were in the wrong sexed body, like that would be so difficult. I'd have a lot of empathy for anybody in that position. And if there was anything medicine could do to help a person like that, I would be supportive. Um, I did think that a lot of the DSM diagnostic criteria was based on gender stereotypes, such as, you know, preferring to play with toys of the opposite sex or things like that. But I didn't give it too much thought. Um, I worked in lots of different settings that have nothing to do with gender, though, of course, I had met Uh, clients along the way who might have struggled with gender identity or um, things like that. But then around 2015, I was working in a middle school as a middle school counselor. And um, I started to notice a couple of things on a very individual level. I had some teenage girls that I had worked with in the school setting that I had known for many years, who kind of suddenly started saying things like, I don't think I'm a girl. I'd like to be referred to by a different name and uh, had, you know, kind of this very rapid presentation of wanting to change their identity. And I was also starting to follow news stories of trans kids. And I just started to notice these kind of convergent elements in my environment. And I thought it was very interesting. So very long story short, I just started researching and trying to understand everything I could about gender identity and the way it's manifesting in the culture. And I ended up um, kind of dedicating my time in private practice to working with young people struggling with identity. So that's kind of a long story, somewhat short. But like on this, like, so the identity aspect. So, I mean, I haven't read that much gender and queer theory. Like I read a lot more of the critical race stuff and intersectionality. but I mean, identity plays such a key part of it. So if you wouldn't mind getting into like what was traditionally, I guess, thought of as dysphoria. And then like, now I've heard the term like rapid onset gender dysphoria. So, and then, I mean, I'm, I look at the stats, um, you know, something like 4,000% increase in the number of girls that are transitioning and things like that. So if you wouldn't mind kind of differentiating between those two things. Sure. Um, I will share with you kind of like what the field says, and then I will just kind of caveat this with, I have some kind of different perspectives on much of this. Okay. So if you were to ask, you know, pretty mainstream, excuse me, if you were to ask like a mainstream psychiatrist, these questions along the way, here's what you might get. So gender dysphoria was considered, um, kind of a condition in which the person is having a lot of distress about their biological sex and claiming to be the other sex or perhaps wishing they were the other sex. And again, in order to get that DSM diagnostic 
criteria met, which it has evolved a little bit over the last you know, decade or so. Um, but you know, you'd have to exhibit like a certain number of these symptoms in a checklist. And those include things like preferring play and clothes and uh, play partners of the opposite sex and identifying as the opposite sex or claiming to be. Okay. So gender dysphoria was typically thought of as, um, well, it was typically a condition that was predominantly found in males presenting pretty young. Um, so in childhood, and for about 80% of those males, and now there's a new study that indicates even maybe higher than 80%, they would grow out of their gender dysphoria and become comfortable with their biological sex. And the, the stat you mentioned about 4,000% is relatively new. This started in the mid 2010s. We saw a very dramatic First of all, sex ratio switch, meaning that children presenting at gender clinics that used to be predominantly boys have been outnumbered by girls. And then the numbers just skyrocketed. So if you were to see like a graph of this, it's, a, it's an absolute slope very rapidly upwards of girls starting to claim that they are having gender identity issues. Um, so gender dysphoria was more of a, a condition you could be diagnosed with. And when you look at the history of treating gender dysphoria, it's very, um, it's very choppy. There is not a lot of emphasis on psychological support. And it's been predominantly thought of as a condition that you intervene with, with medical modifications to the body, such as using hormones or surgery to try and replicate the appearance of the other sex. So that is typically what was thought of as a first line of defense. Part of the reason for that is because the second cohort, so I mentioned that it was typically um, dysphoric boys coming up pretty young, but the second cohort of individuals prior to the mid 2010s who sought to transition were actually um, middle-aged males. And their type of gender dysphoria is quite different from the little boys. Um, and those individuals seem to have some sort of component of uh, possibly like a sexual gratification or um, a paraphilia involved in their desire to transition. And those individuals have historically been very, very fixated on achieving the female appearance once the medical industry made that possible. So that's part of the reason why the history of treating gender dysphoria has not been focused on psychological intervention. So we have these two kinds of dysphorias that presented pre mid 2010s. In very rare cases, there were females with gender dysphoria. And oftentimes when you dig into their histories, unfortunately, there were cases of abuse or family trauma and things like that. And almost always in the cases of girls wanting to transition, they were same sex attracted, meaning they would have been lesbians. Okay. So I'm giving you like a little history on gender dysphoria and its treatment prior to the mid 2010s. But you mentioned identity, which has become a really important part of the discourse today, which is quite different. And so what we're seeing now is that many of the young people who are seeking to transition rather than having this kind of lifelong history of this kind of incongruence experience or really desiring to be the other sex from, from that young age or um, prior to the identity discussion, many young people are exploring the idea of identity almost as a standalone thing, often in response to, um, you know, feeling of, distress, they might go online and seek out answers, you know, they might type into like a Reddit thread or something, why am I uncomfortable with my body? Or why do I feel different from other people? Or why do I feel so strange? Which is a very normal experience in adolescence, right? Um, so a lot of young people are stumbling upon the identity of being trans, almost as a kind of strategy or solution to resolving life problems. And so I have found in my practice, many young people I've worked with latch on to the transgender identity first and then become gender dysphoric after spending a great deal amount of, a great deal of time 
trying to learn about how to be trans, trying to learn about how to, quote, pass as the other gender. And then they kind of develop this sense of um, body discomfort because they're not actually able to achieve the appearance of being a transgender person. So I know that that may sound a bit abstract and I'd love to hear if you have questions or want me to expand on that. But to me, that is what I see as being this new focus on identity as a way to define oneself, as a way to reinvent oneself, as a way to um, kind of pick a new persona to become rather than finding a label that fits what you have already been experiencing. No, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Like one thing I I wondered about, like with, with the identity thing. Um, again, like I said, I've been reading some of this stuff, and I started following. I started following a lot of this around 2014, and um, so so if I take a look at the intersectional feminist side, and you know, women are oppressed. You know, you're going to make 72 cents on the dollar, like you can go through the whole litany of everything that they say, like, you know, and, and so, and then younger and younger girls were getting that information. So I thought what, some of it was, okay, if this is what I'm forced to be, and if I'm going to be a girl and this is, this is my lot in life and I can't escape it, but here's a way for me to get out of it. And, you know, a, is it like being a goth or being a punk or, you know, something like that? Or and it's it's a new thing to become. So and it's going to get me out of being you know an oppressed female, even though they'll. I mean you know talk about oh how trans people are oppressed and you know they'll talk about the suicide rates and all that. But it's so that's what I that I I, I all kind of thought of it like that was part of it. I'm not saying that's like you know all of it because obviously like you mentioned you know going online and you know, d different social media and then like whatever from friends and things like that. But I always thought like that part of it had some issues or it was one of the reasons why you maybe saw more girls wanting to transition because they're being told that if they stay as a, you know, if they're women, they're going to be continuously be oppressed. So I was just wondering if that maybe had something to do with it as well. Gosh, um, I think that can be a factor sometimes. Um, you know, it's important to remember that all of these individual cases are quite unique, even though there are common threads, as of course I've generalized a lot in trying to describe what I'm seeing. They're, they're all very unique. It, it is noteworthy though, you, you raise a good point because many of the young people that I have seen started out um, in some kind of social justice communities online where a lot of this intersectional politics is really, I mean, A, it's very watered down. It's like memefied, tumblerfied, if that's like a term, right? So it's not really a rich, complex, in-depth analysis. It's, it's these very pat phrases and this simple hierarchy that is set up. So if you're a 13-year-old girl and you stumble into these communities where not only do they say that, you know, as a woman, you're going to be oppressed, they also say things like, you know, having cis privilege makes you a uh, part of the oppressor class. And if you are a female poking around in these online spaces, you might be trying to escape kind of both of those things, either the perceived oppression that you're going to experience as a female and also being a cis person when you're perhaps someone who's there because you believe in justice and you want to do the right thing and you don't want to step on anyone's toes. And also maybe you don't want to be stepped on. So in my experience, at, at 13, I don't think young people are making that direct thread. Um, but I do think that having some sort of um, hopefulness about what it means to be female is really, really important. And I think that's part of the vacuum that we see right now. A lot of young girls for, for legitimate reasons and sometimes propaganda reasons, I think you're kind of alluding to that, might feel as though being a girl um, is really difficult. And I, I've certainly seen young people talking about um, in interviews and things like that, people who detransition talking about how they literally thought being a guy would be much easier 
So I think you're on to something there. It may not be the case for everybody, but I think that's certainly a, a portion of these kids have this erroneous belief that being a girl is really hard and only hard, and that being a guy is very easy and only easy. Whereas in reality, of course, you know, teenage girls and teenage boys have different types of issues to grapple with and sometimes similar issues. So there's a bit of a a fantasy that I think can exist in the mind of a young person to where it's almost like the grass is greener on the other side, right? Like if I were that person, I wouldn't be having the problems I'm having now. Whereas that's, that's not quite true. Okay. One other thing about the identity I wanted to like, cause you alluded to a couple of times. So, I mean, whatever I, I was a you know kid in the eighties, I was a teenager in the late eighties. And I remember even like back then, like eight, late eighties, early nineties, they would, they were going away from that, you know, trucks are for boys and dolls are for girls. And they were, you know, it, it was actually, okay. You want to, your, your son plays with dolls. It's a boy that plays with dolls. It's, it's, you know, like it, it was getting accepted. But now, like, I, I see these stereotypes come back. Like, oh, your, your daughter wants short hair, so she must be a boy. And I'm like, seriously? Like, you know, don't remember Pe- Peggy Fleming? Like, I mean, you know, just mm-hmm. so I, like, do you see a lot of that? Like, I'm like, I mean, you, like I said, you'd alluded to it, but I, that, that's one thing that strikes me like so hypocritical about this. Like they're talking about breaking down gender stereotypes, but they're so rigidly attached to them. Yeah, I mean, there's something incredibly bizarre about that. I mean, it's like out of one side of your mouth, you're saying that we're really expanding the gender binary, but out of the other side of your mouth, you're saying everybody who's a man has these specific interests. So you're, you're absolutely right to point that out. I think it's very bizarre. And I mean, I, I can't speak that much to like why this philosophy has developed the way it has, because I don't agree with it. But I can say from the perspective of the young people um, that I've worked with, a lot of them, when you dig into their history, um, tend to hold very black and white beliefs and kind of rigid thinking systems and sometimes even have kind of made up rules in their mind about what girls can do and what boys can do versus the other, right? So sometimes these young people have maybe struggled with that type of black and white thinking. And then here comes an entire belief system and philosophy that, that kind of doubles down and reinforces those incorrect beliefs. So I think it's really destructive to have such a rigid kind of view. Um, But on the other hand, what I think is very interesting is that when you look at um, the, the influence of queer theory and the, dismantling of boundaries in general and categories, you also see something which leads to almost like an absurdist uh, presentation of gender where you might see uh, an individual who's clearly biologically male and has a beard and, and perhaps is wearing lipstick and has breasts. And this individual is now, you know, um, some kind of other gender. So I think you're right in a way that there are some aspects of this where there's very rigid stereotyped categories. And there's also the introduction of brand new categories of people such as non-binary or agender, or um, just, I mean, there's a long list of new mm-hmm. supposed gender identities. So it's, it's both rigid and it's also just constantly creating new labels for just random hodgepodges of presentations, if that makes sense. I'm just, cause I've spoken to a couple of detransitioners and then, I mean, like, again, like I just started following some of this stuff and I see what's going on and you're in a small minority of therapists who are actually, I'm not saying you're trying to stop people from transitioning or anything, if they're actually gender dysphoric or, but you're actually trying to deal with the underlying issues from what I can see. I mean, like I, when I spoke to, um, you know, one young woman, Helena, and she was like, it took her like basically an afternoon to get, you know, or like hormones and all that. And it's, it's, I'm, I mean, that's a little crazy. Like why is the medical community just going along so readily with that? Like, hmm. I think there's lots of different reasons for that. <clears throat> First of all, um, I want to say this is not the first time that our field has kind of gotten seduced 
by a very novel and intriguing diagnosis and the path of treatment for it. So, I mean, as an example, you can look at the really dark history of lobotomies in the 40s. Um, this really swept across the American medical establishment and there were chopping parts of brains out left and right. It's absolutely shocking. You can also see that there was a uh, multiple personality disorder and um, satanic abuse um, kind of epidemic of false memories in the eighties and nineties. So this is not new for our field to get absorbed by some sexy new diagnosis and to start treating it with aggressive miracle cures. Some people have even drawn the parallel to the opioid crisis where pain management or, or pain medications were just distributed um, at the basically desire of the patient. So this is not a brand new thing to happen. Um, but I also think what makes this particularly insidious is that <clears throat> there's been really robust uh, capture of institutions. Um, and anybody who tries to challenge this perspective is often met with a lot of animosity and sometimes even um, kind of the, the, the kind of cancel culture mobs can come after people. Um, but to, to clarify, you know, I, I may be one of few clinicians that is very public with my stance, but the truth is there are lots of therapists who see what is going on and recognize that we're doing a lot of harm to young people by refusing to explore all of the underlying issues. And I think therapists are starting to mobilize. So for example, um, I am part of a, an organization called the Gender Exploratory Therapy Association. And we are a, we're just a new organization, but we are starting to grow. And we're therapists who believe in the right of patients to have proper good old fashioned therapy where we respect the individual's identity. We don't necessarily um, push them on it or tell them what to, to think about themselves, but we do think that everybody in a good course of therapy should be curious about exploring their patterns, their defenses, their family history, their personality traits, their relationships to understand themselves as a whole person, as a big picture. Um, so I don't think actually it's quite as rare as we might think. Um, I think cancel culture on one hand has scared and shut a lot of people down. And on the other hand, I think it can create the illusion that nobody is really standing up to this belief system. Whereas in fact, therapists are starting to organize and mobilize and create a kind of counter narrative that really focuses on psychological exploration. And, and if I might, just to kind of touch on what I mentioned earlier, when you look at the history of treating gender dysphoria, the entire um, literature has really not explored what does a psychological treatment that is compassionate and um, curious about the person and treats the person as a whole individual, that's almost never been the case. When you see, some of the very dismissive and harsh and judgmental um, therapies that were coming from the kind of psychoanalytical community, they were very disparaging and they treated uh, transgender individuals, transsexual individuals, like they had some kind of a perversion. And that's not helpful at all. So I, I am really advocating and, and my co-host on the podcast, Gender A Wider Lens, we're really advocating for almost a, a brand new type of exploration, which is based on the same principles of any good therapy, that the therapeutic relationship is important, that the individual should be seen as a whole person, that their development should be taken into consideration. So for example, adolescents have different needs than do 25 year olds, than do 35 year olds, right? So we're really trying to advocate for more holistic approach to people who are struggling with gender well, I mean, that's actually really good to hear about, you know, psychologists actually, or therapists and, you know, people in the field, like getting organizing and, you know, trying to put a little bit of pushback. Cause I mean, again, I just, I just know what I see online, so I can't, you know, I, I have to go by that. And it's just, 
you know, when you hear about schools saying, okay, well, we'll hide, you know, kids transitioning and things like that. And my, my view on this is, okay, if you're an adult and you want to transition, fill your boots, but I'm really concerned about the kids. Like I, you know, okay. And I have no dog in this fight. Like I don't have kids in school or anything like that. I don't have, you know, I don't have kids period. So it's not, but I don't want to see children just being given treatment for no good reason. I mean, be it like, you know, hormone therapy or puberty blockers. I mean, or if it gets to the point of like, you know, surgeries and stuff like that, like I, that's where I, I get confused. Like, that's what worries me is like, or, or I should say worries me. Like, like it puzzles me. Like, okay, you're giving kids harmful medication at a very young age. I mean, like that's like, is that just coming from a family doctor or do they have to go through like a gender clinic first? Like it does like, like that, I, I don't get how that can just be allowed to happen. Mm. Well, I'll tell you what, what mo- most commonly happens. So, I mean, there are a couple scenarios that come to mind. Like I said, a lot of the, the current cohort of teenagers seeking to transition don't have a history of gender dysphoria. So I'm talking about those kids. Now, if we wanted to explore what this looks like for younger kids, like five, six and seven year olds, we can talk about that later, but it's a little bit different. But these kids are typically kids who are kind of having a somewhat normal childhood. Lots of the typical struggles that some young people experience, like maybe social isolation, maybe some bullying, maybe they're struggling with self-harm or disordered eating or anxiety, like all kinds of kind of typical, I say typical, I don't mean to diminish the difficulty of them, but like common mental health struggles that young people have. And sometimes they have a therapist they're working with beforehand for those other things. And then usually when a young person starts talking about gender, one of two things will happen. Either their current therapist, who's usually a kind of generalist, right? So I treat kids, you know, with all kinds of issues. They hear the word gender and they either think, I don't know anything about this. I'm not sure how to treat this. I don't have the expertise. So I'm going to refer this child to what's considered a pediatric gender clinic. These are clinics that really operate based on the idea that gender identity is a real thing. We all have one and we need to align our gender identity with our body. Okay. So that's one concept that exists in the gender clinic, which I can talk about that later too. Or the therapist says, oh, gender identity. Hmm, I've learned about this. What you do when this happens is you affirm right away or else the child is going to be at a risk of suicide, which I will just state there is no data to indicate that. There is no data to indicate that a child just simply saying they are struggling with gender means that you that your affirmation will help them feel better or that you are preventing suicidality by doing so. Um, So therapists just kind of either shuttle the kid off to a gender specialist, or they tend to look at the child through a very narrow lens, which is what I have sitting here in front of me is no longer Amy, who I literally knew five minutes ago as being a girl with mental health issues, a girl with an eating disorder, a girl with all these self-harm issues. This is now literally a trans child. And the way we talk to and treat a trans child is so patently different. And it's this kind of cascade of step by step of like, first you affirm the name, then you change the pronouns, then you help the kid get a binder, then you do this, then you do that, then you do that. So it's a very unusual way of approaching an adolescent, particularly because you mentioned early being goth and stuff like that, right? Mm. Trying on different identities is a part of the job of the teenager. But if you have a teenager that says, you know, I'm, I'm going to use something from my time because I'm not of this generation. But if you have a teenager that says, you know, hey, mom, I'm 14. I want to be Kurt Cobain when I grow up and I'm going to start a rock band you know, you might say, cool, honey, like, yeah, sure, we'll get you a guitar, but you're not going to take them out of school and like sign them up for a record deal. You know, like there's an appropriate way that we have to hold teenage identity exploration lightly because it does, it's not necessarily meant to be taken as a literal fact, like written in stone about that child. So 
Whereas I don't think that we should necessarily, you know, tell a child, no, it's impossible. You're not trans. I mean, I don't think we should try to talk them out of it. I also think the affirmative approach, like the hormones that you were talking about, is an incredibly um, literal rubber stamping of identity exploration, which may not necessarily lead to a permanent landing place. Okay. Like, just one of the things you'd mentioned in there about the, the suicide, because I wanted to ask you about that, but since you mentioned it, I, like, do you get a, when you're dealing with these kids, like, do you get parents who are worried about suicide? I mean, like, I'm just wondering like how much of it is as soon as the parents hear, okay, your kid might be trans then they're okay well i have to affirm it because then i don't want to, i don't want to lose my kid because i mean i you see the the slogans you know would you rather have a a live son than a dead daughter or like things yeah. like that so mm -hmm. do you see a lot of that from the parents or do you even like deal with the parents in your in your uh, therapy well my personal caseload of kids that i've been seeing on a long-term basis is quite small but i do consult frequently with families so i've consulted with about 500 families so I do think that this is a concern for many of them. Um, but I, I want to, I mean, the suicide issue is really important and, and it's too important to be misinformed about. So I kind of want to take it step by step so we can break it down. Yeah, please. So kids who are struggling with gender dysphoria have about the same level of thoughts about self-harm or suicide or suicidality as other kids with other mental health issues. And actually, if you look at them side by side with things like schizophrenia or eating disorders or depression, kids with gender dysphoria's suicidal thoughts are actually not the highest, but they're still significant. And whenever we're talking about suicidality, it's very important to take it seriously. So I don't want to be dismissive in any way of the fact that some young people struggling with their gender may also be thinking about things like suicide. But what's important to remember is that the, the one survey that we have, which was an online survey that usually is referred to as that kind of 41% suicide, there's many, many problems with that study that make it unreliable. So again, first of all, it's an online survey and there's really no screening method for who filled it out. Secondly, there's no indication in the, in the questions of whether the young person's suicidal thoughts that they claim to have are because of their gender dysphoria or because of their other mental health issues or because of family problems, or because they're not being supported. So it's really not clear when an, a, a kid takes that survey online and they report that they've thought about suicide, where that comes from. Um, and luckily, you know, the actual rates of young people attempting suicide who have gender dysphoria are very low. And as a matter of fact, the Tavistock Clinic which is the largest gender clinic in the UK, they reported, it literally says, thankfully, the suicide rates are incredibly low. So there's, there's so much hype around this issue. And unfortunately, I think a lot of the trans advocacy groups are being incredibly unethical by continuing to say trans kids are at risk of suicide, trans kids are at risk of suicide, because one of the things we know is that suicidality is susceptible to social contagion. So I don't know if you were aware, but in Palo Alto, California, I think around 2015, there was like this string of teenage suicides at a particular school in the um, part of Northern California. And what we know is that even the journalists um, are advised by CDC to be very careful how they talk about suicide because it's so vulnerable to social contagion. So what I have heard from working with young people is they hear these stats uh, about suicidality in trans youth and they, they think, oh my God, I'm going to become suicidal, even if they're not actually suicidal, right? So it's, it's very, very tricky and it's very important for um, these advocacy groups to be much more careful how they talk about this because it's not helping, first of all. So to, to get back to your actual question, parents who contact me 
um, they, they may have seen that their child was already in a dark place. So like a very common scenario I've heard in the last year or so is that when my kids school got locked down for COVID and they started being home alone all day, every day, weeks and weeks and weeks on end, they kind of plummeted into a depression. And so understandably, when you see that your child is doing really poorly, and then they also come out and say, by the way, I'm transgender, parents become very alarmed. And then like any, any parent these days, they go online and start researching. And if they stumble upon an advocacy group, which is kind of um, supporting the affirmative model of care, they likely would have read, you have to affirm your child or they will be suicidal, which again, it's not accurate. Um, sometimes to kind of go back to that therapist scenario, sometimes therapists, like you mentioned, will tell parents, your choices are having a live daughter or dead son or whatever the case may be. So it's, it's A, it's incredibly manipulative. I mean, in what scenario does a mental health professional tell a parent, if you don't do A, B, and C, your kid is going to kill themselves? I cannot think of any scenario in which a therapist would say that except for this. So it's, it's bizarre, it's unusual, and frankly, it's not true. What we also know, because any therapist who has worked with teenagers for any amount of time has likely encountered a young person full of angst and distress who might fantasize about suicide. And we have good ways to support that young person that are all about stability and building the relationship and leaning in from the family with love and structure and care. So there's just so much about the suicide narrative that is distorting and inaccurate. Um, and so when families do have that concern, what I often find is most helpful is when the family really strategizes about how to lean in and work on their connection with their child. And I often hear back from families that I've consulted with or talked with who found it to be very, very helpful to say, you know what? We're just going to, we're going to take a big pause here. Obviously you're struggling with something important to you that is difficult. We see that you're hurting. We're really going to strategize about how to enrich your life in general, how to make you feel better in general. And we're going to focus on helping you be a healthier, happier, whole person. And usually when families are able to lean in, start spending a lot more time with their kid, trying to fill their kid's life with important and enriching activities that they might be craving. So, you know, one very simple example is a lot of these kids have had a rift in their friendship group, or they, they were bullied at school, or they don't have peers. And so one of the needs that they might be trying to meet is a social need. So if your kid is struggling socially, like A, the family relationship really matters, but B, See if you can help encourage the child to find some sort of a peer group, get them in some extracurricular activities, put them in a karate club, like whatever it may be. So I find that even when there's some severe distress, common sense, engaged, loving families can really help their kid to get to a better place without letting that suicide narrative drive them into medical interventions that may not actually help the child. Okay. Just kind of on that, because something you mentioned just kind of just sparked a question here. Um, so like the, the whole suicide narrative part of it, you know, like if you'll look at some of the stuff that Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff and like the coddling the American mind, they were talking about and how like, you know, social media with teenage girls and like rise in depression and all these other things. And a kid, I mean, teenagers are, I mean, it's not hard to make teenagers depressed. I mean, it's, it's fairly easy. Um, but if that's driving like a higher rate of depression and then like the girls are feeling suicidal and they go online to try to look up something like that and they come across the trans stat, like 41% of trans people, trans kids will commit suicide if they don't get therapy. Would that lead them to think, okay, well, I'm suicidal, so maybe I'm trans? I, I think there's an infinite number of directions things could go. I mean, I think that's very possible. Um, I think th the truth is that 
manageable explanations are tempting for all of us, Mm -hmm. especially when you're a teenager, you're distressed, your, your brain is not fully developed. You do not have the coping strategies yet. You can be the most brilliant, you know, IQ of a billion teenager, but you're still a teenager and you're still not really an emotionally regulated adult yet. And so young people crave explanations which are clear and actionable. So they are really tempted to find this kind of one size fits all explanation for what's going on. I I don't know if it's, I was suicidal, therefore maybe I'm trans. I think it's entirely plausible. I think it's kind of more like a fitting together of puzzle pieces, right? That might be one piece of the puzzle. Then they might also kind of think about the time when they were 10 and they split the kids up at PE and they just kind of had a weird feeling about it, right? They weren't gender dysphoric per se, but they had a weird gender distress. And then they piece together, oh, I have always felt different than the other girls because I remember when I was in the locker room and I was changing, I was embarrassed of my body. And that's another puzzle piece. So it's like all these little puzzle pieces can fit together and really start to create a picture that screams, I know how to fix this. It's not this vague, nebulous um, distress that I just have to wait it out 10, 15 years. That sounds horrible. But if I have a concrete solution, that's very tempting. So, um, yeah. Okay. Now, like I said, it was just something that popped in my head. I, I'm gonna, like, I'm not sure if you are even going to be able to answer this, but so, I mean, it's just because of the articles in like pink news and code pink and all that, but like about Iran and Pakistan, about how, you know, look how forward they are and progressive they are because they offer free transitions, their you know, surgeries and all that. I mean, Iran does it like they both give the, you know, if they find a gay couple, whether it's homosexual or lesbian, they just say, okay, you know what? You know, like you're going to, one of you has to transition or you're going to get killed. Like, I mean, so it's, it's, it's forced transitioning. Now, I've heard a couple of things and I don't know how reliable this is. So I don't like, I'm just speculating here, but Mm -hmm. of like very traditional Christian families in the U S who would prefer to have a trans kid instead of a gay kid. Yeah. So like, are you seeing any of that or is there anything to that in the States? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, this alludes to something I mentioned really briefly earlier, but Um, there's a certain type of parent that contacts me. So I have kind of talked a lot very openly about specifically the rapid onset gender dysphoria kids who, again, they're around adolescent years and that I actually think we should slow down and explore what's going on. So by definition, people who contact me want to um, encourage their child to resolve their distress without transition. So I, I've certainly been following these news stories and I have other colleagues who work with families of younger kids. And I've also consulted with families who had been to gender clinics with their, when their children were very young. And I definitely think there are some families who would rather transition their child than have a gay child. And there are probably several reasons for that. First of all, the truth is, you know, no matter what slogans we adopt as a culture, I think most people have a kind of visceral reaction to seeing a very feminine little boy. And I don't mean it's always a hateful reaction, but it is a reaction that I think many of us have a hard time talking about, which is just sensing that that child is very different, recognizing that that child is feminine, and and maybe even recognizing that that boy will likely grow up to be a gay man. And there's something weird, I think, philosophically about looking at a small child and then making a prediction about their sexuality. I think that like feels really weird in people. Though historically, if you look at the you know, what we have known about gender dysphoria and sexual orientation and femininity and masculinity, that is the likely trajectory for many of those kids. Um, So I think there's still a lot of people 
who maybe they're not conscious of it, but they just cannot tolerate the idea of having a very feminine male child or having a lesbian daughter. And in fact, there is a pretty famous case. I cannot remember the name of the mother now, but she's somewhere in Texas. And she freely admits in interviews that when her son, who now, by the way, identifies as a trans girl, they've become quite famous, but her son was a very feminine little boy. And she said, you know, we are from a conservative Christian community and we tried everything to make him stop being feminine. You know, she even said, we, we used to beat our kid and we would feel terrible about the beatings. So to me, that is absolutely shocking. And, and everybody in, in society should really sit up and wonder about how that woman went from basically trying to beat the femininity out of her child to being revered as a hero for being a trans girl's mom. There's something really powerful about that as a, I think it should serve as a kind of warning about what this gender identity belief system can end up doing. Yeah. Okay. Like I, I hadn't heard about that, but that's, I mean, that's horrific. Like, I mean, I'm sorry. When she admitted she was beating her child, like at that point, you know, CPS should step in and take the child away. Like, I mean, there's got to be a limit here. <laughs> like, you know, I'm, um, look, I didn't want to keep you too, too much longer, but I, there's a couple of things I wanted to ask you about. Like, now these are, because th- I live up in Canada and we were. I'm from Montreal for- too, by the way. I was born in Montreal. Oh, cool. Yeah. You're from Montreal, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm in Montreal right now. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so. I mean, we're further along this path than the U.S. And I mean, we had a slight reprieve because we had the election. And so Bill C-6 didn't get passed, but they're going to reintroduce it. And it's you know completely gender affirming therapy. And one of the cases I'd heard about, and this was in Ontario, and this was before C-6 had passed, but Ontario has a version of it where, you know, the parents have to affirm the gender of the child otherwise the, the government could take the child away and it was a case in a school and i believe is in ottawa but i could be wrong but it was in ontario and a little it was a six-year-old boy who was autistic went to a new school walked into the wrong washroom and then when they came out when he came out there was a school official there i don't know if it was administrator teacher whatever, but there was a school official there who said, oh, have you told your parents that you're a girl? Oh, my God. And the little kid said, no, I didn't, because that would make them mad. And like I said, the kid was autistic. Mm. Child Protective Services took the kid away for three days. And I'm I'm looking at this, and again, okay, you know, I realize there are times when the state has to step in, like when it's a really abusive parent or whatever, but when you're telling like parents of a child that young, that if they say that they're a boy or a girl, and when, you know, like they say that, that they're the opposite sex, that if if you don't affirm it, you're going to take the kid away. And then schools doing stuff like that. Like, I don't know. Maybe I'm just renting, but I'm like, it just, it just, I mean, that just, that freaks me out. I'm like, how can you do that? Yeah. It's, it's very bizarre. I mean, I've, I've, I can't really speak much to the situation in Canada. I would encourage um, audience members to check out genderreport.ca. It's an organization of parents and professionals who are kind of concerned about the medicalization of this. And they really keep up with all of the kind of legislation news happening in Canada. So that's gender uh, genderreport.ca. Um, but I have, I have uh, been contacted by families who are in kind of um, CPS issues because they refuse to affirm their kid. And, you know, it's, it's absolutely shocking and terrifying because, um, you know, it's funny, like, I'll just kind of make this side note. I remember talking with some colleagues about this, like, like like-minded colleagues and, and saying, you know, when I have worked with um, families in kind of really, really, terrible situations where there's serious abuse going on. It's been so hard to get CPS to get involved in cases where I know serious abuse is happening. And so then to hear about families that are 
otherwise engaged and loving, and maybe they have like normal family problems, but just based on not affirming a kid's supposed gender identity that they are getting CPS involvement is just really terrifying. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't really know how to answer that. It's, it's also something that I feel very concerned about and really distressed about. Now I can speak for the U S what often happens here is that a CPS caseworker will come out, do some sort of evaluation of the home. And in the cases that I am personally aware of, thank goodness, um, in the US, no kids have ever been taken from their parents. Usually the CPS caseworker comes and just says, you have to affirm your kid. Now that in and of itself, I think is a violation of the parental rights to decide for themselves what they think is best. Um, But I haven't heard of it get to that point, though there are certainly cases I may not be aware of. No, no, like I said, it was just, I mean, like I said, I was just frantic because like that, again, you know, adults do whatever you want. Like you're an adult, you're grown, make up whatever decisions, but at a certain point, like do, doing this to kids, like that's like you'd mentioned the, the you'd mentioned the satanic rituals, whatever, whatever. That, that was only like 50 cases, but I'm just like, I mean, if, if the pendulum swings the other way, like the amount of lawsuits that are going to come out of this is mm. just insane. And I mean, you know, that's, that's like the least of the things we should think about, but I'm just still thinking like you're harming kids. Like you're, you're physically harming them and you're mentally harming them. And I'm just like how they expect to have well-adjusted adults come out of this. Like it's just beyond me. Yeah. I mean, to, to kind of not play devil's advocate per se, but, but to try and understand how this is happening, because I've spent many years now trying to understand like, how the hell did we get here? Cause like you, I find this to be kind of shocking. Um, One of the drivers behind this early intervention push, remember I told you earlier about those two populations of people who used to transition before 2010s, and one of them was little boys and one of them was middle-aged men. And what, what happens with the individuals who have gone through male puberty, let's say you have a 30 year old male person who wants to transition to be female. It's very challenging for that individual to successfully kind of pass as a female person because male puberty just has such a powerful impact on the body. So adult transitioners have historically said, I wished I could have transitioned when I was younger. And those individuals have had, I think, hugely disproportionate and frankly, post hoc um, input on what we should be doing with dysphoric kids. Because first of all, you can't really say in hindsight what you think you would have wanted because you wouldn't be the person you are now had you transitioned as a kid. So first of all, that's just like, it's philosophically not accurate to say that. We are historically bad at predicting what would have been better for us, especially if we've lived to a certain point without it. So A, that doesn't make sense. And B, um, to project that particular experience of adult male transitioners onto all the dysphoric kids from today is also incorrect because we know this is a very different population. So that's one of the reasons why there's such a push to transition kids. And I think the second reason why, you know, from from the interactions I've had with the affirmative clinicians, they really, really believe what they think. They really believe what they're saying and they truly believe, and I don't believe it. So it's hard for me to understand, but they truly believe that when you have a dysphoric 12 year old female in front of you, you're actually literally talking to a boy with the wrong body parts. I know it's a bit crazy. (laughs) It's it's very abstract and it's a, a bit nutty, but They really have discarded even, you know, as a, as a clinician, when I'm consulting with people about a case, for example, we have to identify the characteristics of the person. So if I'm working with you, I would say like, I have an adult male client who runs a podcast and we're talking about so-and-so issues. The clinicians who work in the gender affirmative model, they don't even talk about their clients in their natal sex. They, they literally like take that and just shove it out of their consciousness. Like it's a very odd thing, 
But I think that can partially help us understand how do they justify putting these drugs into these kids because they literally don't think of them as their natal sex anymore. I don't know if that's helpful. It's really yeah. loopy, uh, but that's what I've observed. Okay, when you mentioned like, okay, yo, this is what they really believe. Now, one of the reasons I got into all this stuff was um, I come back from overseas and I started, you know, whatever. I was, I was critical of things like I, you know, I, the last place I came back from was Afghanistan and I was critical of things like the hijab and the burqa and whatever. And so, and but I kept hearing it. Oh, they don't really believe that. They don't really believe that. And I'm seeing the same platitudes now. It's like, I mean, I just see it all the time. Like, oh, they can't. No one really believes that. No one really believes that you can. And I'm like, no, that's it's it's a religion. Like they, like I, I mean, can, I think John McWhorter is onto something there when he says, you know, it's a, it's an actual like you know, it's a religion of wokeism. Like it, it's, and it is a religion, and they they believe it. And I'm just like, these are true believers. That they're, they're not. You know, they're not doing it rationally. They're doing it from like an emotive place. Mm, That's very interesting. So when, when people were saying that in the context of like your objections to certain aspects of like fundamentalist Islam, were they saying that Muslim people don't really believe that? Or yeah, I mean the, or so, you know, whatever, let's take it to the, uh, you know, extreme here. Like, so someone blows themselves up and yells, Allahu Akbar. Oh, they don't really believe what they're doing. They're doing it for economic reasons. They're doing it for this. They're doing it for that. They don't actually, they're not doing it for faith. There was a guy, um, he'd done a lot of work with the UN. I think his name was Scott Atran. I mean, he just came out and said it. I was like, there's like, he was doing a lot of work in Palestine. And he said, there's not one single Palestine, Palestinian suicide bomber that does it because of religion. Like not a single one. I'm like, okay, that's a pretty bold statement to make you know like we can talk mm. about why they all do it so but i mean I, I saw that a lot with like the discussion around islam like oh they can't really believe that you know they're going to get 72 virgins i'm like okay it depends on how extreme they are it depends on how fundamentalist they are it depends on which brand of islam they studied and you know and how they were brought up but yeah there are people who believe you're going to get 72 virgins i mean it's mm. And I see the same, th- I, I, the same platitudes and same excuses I saw for fundamentalist Islam in you know 2014. I'm seeing in the last couple of years for like some of the statements coming out of critical race theory, some of the like you know the stuff coming out of the gender stuff and the queer theory, and it's just I'm like, and it's from the same people, mm. and I'm just it, it, like I I just see so many similarities with that. I'm like, you're dealing with a cult, you're dealing with a like it's 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 a nascent religion. And you're dealing with, you know, people who are, again, I, I could go back to Islam. I'm like, these are like people who converted to Islam. I'm like the people who converted to Islam, like they get really fundamentalist really fast. And I'm like, so you're dealing with fresh converts. And I'm like, mm-hmm. that's why they're so zealous. And so, I mean, like it, it, part of that is it, it's there, like there, there is something there. <laughs> that's an amazing um, analogy because I see this with the young kids who first take on like a radical Mm -hmm. social justice perspective, which happens to get mixed in with all the trans ideology and trans feminism or whatever it's called. And they do feel like new converts to a religion. Like they've bought it hook, line and sinker. Everybody who doesn't agree is the enemy. Mom and dad are the enemy. They start Mm -hmm. interpreting everything through this particular worldview. And I think that's a really interesting um, analogy And I guess like as a therapist, one of the things I believe is that it's not just faulty beliefs that we are dealing with here. It's the fact that everybody has to find meaning in something. And of course, religions have historically provided some sort of meaning. And I think what happens in the fundamentalist branches of these things is that everything gets taken very literally. It's kind of like the evangelical right here. You know, there's a very literal aspect to how they interpret the words in their holy books or whatever. And I think the same thing can be said about gender. Like, if we could hold this as a metaphor, right? Like, if we said, you know, metaphorically, I'm both a male and a female, or metaphorically, I'm neither. That's very different from saying, I'm literally neither, so you cannot call me she like 
the, the way that things have become so concrete and literal makes it very hard to even explore them in a playful manner or take it lightly or just, um, you know, just hold it in a way that isn't so intense and life or death. I mean, I feel like fundamentalism always leads people into a feeling of like, this is a life or death scenario. And you see that with trans activism, mm. right? The whole suicide thing. Yeah. So I think it's a very interesting analogy that you bring up there. Just one last thing. Um, like I said, I don't want to keep you too, too much longer, but like it's kind of sticking with this though, because like I said, I'd mentioned I'd spoken to a couple of detransitioners. One of them was um, this young woman, Helena, and the other one was um, uh, Sinead. She goes mm-hmm. by around once. And I'd ask them both this again, because when you look at converts, like when I saw converts to Islam, they were really fundamentalist and they were really hardcore for about five years. And either they then you know, left Islam because they just got completely disillusioned or they mellowed out for the most part. I mean, there were some that, you know, stayed very fundamentalist, but, and so I was asking them about that. Like, you know, if you started this as a 13 year old girl, like if you don't go through the transition after, is it, is it about the five or six year mark that where you might think, okay, well, I'm tired of this. It's, I gotta go, I'm going to go on to something else. Um, like, I'm just wondering about that. Like, is it like, as if they are, you know, quote unquote converts to a new faith, is it in the same kind of range? That's, that's fascinating. Well, this is something I've tried to learn and study a lot more about mm-hmm. in order to understand this whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, that five or six year range sounds about right to me. I mean, first of all, like I said earlier, development is very important. And so um keeping in mind that between the ages of like, if kids are adopting these beliefs between the ages of 13 and 15, they're at a specific point in life where they just don't even have the capacity to think in that complex of a manner anyway. I mean, teenagers are intense to begin with, you know? Um, And around the, the five or six year mark from that point is when the brain starts to become more fully developed. And also what I think happens, and I don't know if this is true for, uh, recent converts to Islam, but I, I, you know, I would suspect that there's a kind of illusion that new converts have about how perfect and glorious everything will be. And then when you start to like, look around and be like, life is still kind of shitty. Like everything still sucks in some ways. And no, this didn't bring me some magic utopia of brotherhood and love. Like it's not, it's that the bubble gets burst at some point, right? And I think that's what causes people to mellow out. And I can say for, for you know, young people that I work with, that sometimes there's a desistance in a couple of years or a detransition. And in my experience, even people who continue to pursue transition, by the time they're five or six years in, they just have much more realistic and flexible ideas about what this means who they are. Did this really solve every single problem I had? Did I really become this brand new person? No, you know, maybe I've shifted some things in my life where I'm, you know, adopting this different identity, but it's not necessarily this kind of magical fantasy transformation that I thought it would be. And I suspect that's probably true too, for people who kind of mellow out, as you said, or have the bubble burst. Well, thanks a lot. Um, if you want to let people know where they can get a hold of you, and if you could, wouldn't mind giving the address of, you said you'd started working with some therapists. If you have like a website for that as well, I'll, I'll put all, all that in the links. Yeah, sure. So um, my podcast that I run with Stella, we kind of look at the psychological meaning behind the concept of gender, how it's kind of exploding, exploding in society. And we talk a lot to Um, parents of dysphoric kids and dysphoric people themselves. So that's gender, a wider lens podcast. Um, If people want to get a hold of me, um, if it's kind of for interviews or press things, they can certainly uh, reach out to me um, by phone. I have my email address there and I can share my phone number with you. And then if um, people want to look at the gender exploratory therapy association, I will send the uh, links to you as well. So you can put all of that in the show notes. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.
and thank you very much for coming on. This was great talking to you. Like, I mean, kind of cleared up some of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> it was really nice to speak to you. I mean, you asked a lot of interesting questions and it was a great discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you. And thanks everyone for listening. <laughs>